Good evening, it's Monday night. Sorry this video is late. I uh, had a bit of an issue today. I had a pipe break and I had a lake in my bathroom. Um, unfortunately my two-year-old tried to go swimming in the lake and he hasn't had swimming lessons yet. So we're going to go ahead and get this out of the way right now. It's going to be at the beginning of today's video. Your secret word is flood. My bathroom had a flood today. So the secret word is flood. Okay, so moving on from there, uh, today we're going to talk about the first part of Ancient Greece. Uh, it's a two-part lecture, half of it today, half of it will be on Wednesday. So uh, we're going to talk about the early part of Greece today and see how this goes. Alright, the earliest Greek people, there are two that you need to know about. There's the Minoans and there's the Mycenaeans. The Minoans live on the island of Crete, it's just south of the mainland of Greece. And it's named after the mythical king Minos. Was Minos real? I don't know. Um, nobody really does. That's why he's mythical. Uh, their language has not been completely deciphered. There are two different languages. There's something called Linear A and Linear B. One of them was deciphered and a researcher was working on the other language. Unfortunately, he died in a car crash and so we have not been able to completely decipher uh, the Minoan alphabet or literature or anything. So a lot of what we know is based off of archaeology, guesses, and anthropology. Uh, their culture was based on palaces. They were, the palaces were probably their economic and political center. Some of the palaces were bigger than others. We don't know if it was one king that had multiple palaces or if there were multiple kings. We just don't know. Uh, we find evidence of the Minoans all through the Mediterranean Sea and Egypt and, and what's today Turkey, mainland Greece, France, you name it. So we know that they traded throughout the area. We know that they even traded with people in southwestern Asia. We also think that they were probably controlled from the top. We think the king and the nobles were probably the ones who governed everybody and then the, the workers were underneath them. Uh, we know that they didn't have very many weapons, which means they were probably peaceful, although if you think about it, living on an island, that's pretty much a fortress, but hey, who knows. Uh, we know that they disappeared somewhere around 1650, but we're not 100% sure why. We're pretty sure that they were taken over and destroyed by the Mycenaeans. Now, who were the Mycenaeans? Well, they lived on mainland Greece, right at the southern tip near uh, the city of Mycenae. Much like the Minoans, they had kings that ruled from palaces, and these palaces were economic and political centers. We know there was a strict division of labor. Everybody worked for the king. They eventually attacked and destroyed the Minoans. And then they themselves, for whatever reason, are destroyed around 1100 BC. And our best guess on that, the Mycenaeans basically, they destroyed themselves through warfare. Now, after they're gone, you get something called the Dark Ages of Greece. It sounds pretty daunting, doesn't it? It's about a 300 year period. It's this period of poverty, disruption, the literacy is lost, but it becomes kind of the defining moment in Greek culture, if you will. I take, exact, for example, the language. Uh, there's a group of people called the Phoenicians. And the Phoenician alphabet is going to be adopted and become the Greek alphabet. The Greek alphabet becomes the Roman alphabet, and the Roman alphabet is what the English alphabet is based off of. So we get our alphabet, our language, in many ways from this dark age of Greece. You also have the great poet Homer, who in reality was probably more than one person. But these, this Homeric age, it's this oral tradition, since nobody can write, where stories start to get passed down and they develop over time into these great adventures, these epic poems, if you will. And, uh, if you've ever read the Odyssey or the Iliad, that develops during the Dark Ages of Greece. As important as the language and the oral tradition are, it's really the polis that is the most important thing. Or polis really means city-state. Now think of it more like a modern-day county. If you're listening to this and you're in Carrollton, it's the Carroll County Polis. If you're listening to this from Noonan or LaGrange, same thing. It's the Troop County Polis or the Coweta County Polis, etc, etc. So it's not just the city itself, but it's the city and all the surrounding area too. Now, 
most of the city-states have very similar features. For one, there's something called the Acropolis. The Acropolis, it's usually going to be near the center of the polis. It's this hill where they can defend themselves as a last-ditch effort. And because it is a place they can easily defend, that's going to be where their temples are, their places of worship. You also have something called the Agora. Um, if you've ever heard of agoraphobia, that means the fear of wide open spaces or the fear of outdoors. That comes from the word agora. Agora was a wide open meeting space where people could meet and do their business. It's where the warriors could meet before they went off to war. And it ends up being where all the public buildings are going to be built. And then right next to the agora is a, an area for celebration, dancing, and theater. Around the city itself is something called the Cora, and that's made up of three parts. The farmland, the pastureland, and the wasteland. Farmland, food. Pastureland, animals. Wasteland, it sounds like it should be for trash, but in reality, that's where all the rock quarries were and the mines were. Now overall, these city-states were not very friendly to outsiders. It's kind of like in high school when you have your, your group of friends or the cliques if you will, and somebody tries to join your group of friends, it's a little bit weird at first. Kind of the same thing. Uh, you could have two city-states that are next door to each other and they could have completely different laws, completely different customs, and they, they don't trust people from the outside. Now, governing the phalanx, or governing the polis, you have this government system that could be used. And then you also have the hoplite phalanx. Two very, very important things. So there could be a couple different types of government. You could have monarchy, ruled by one. Aristocracy, ruled by the wealthy. Oligarchy, ruled by just a few people. Or you have democracy. Democracy is actually kind of the least used, even though we think of Greek democracy. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's important. But when it comes to actually being put in use, it's not as popular in ancient Greece as we like to make it sound. And then you have something called tyranny. Today, if you think of a tyrant, you might think of Fidel Castro or Hitler or, or um, Gaddafi or Hussein. You can name it over and over again. But originally, tyranny, somebody who was a tyrant back then, was just somebody who took power through illegal means. They could be the best meaning person in the world, but if they didn't get elected to that position, they were a tyrant. So tyrants in Greece could be good or bad. Now the hoplite phalanx. If it, we were in person, I would do a demonstration right now so um, you could understand it. We can't, so try to use your imagination and use these two pictures here. The hoplite was the name of the, of the soldier. And it was somebody who was usually a farmer. They have to provide all their own weapons. Uh, for armor, they wear a helmet. They wear a breastplate to cover their chest, shin guards to cover their, their feet, and a round sword. And you can see here, these round swords here in the front, they are meant to protect the people. Up here in this picture, you can see everybody has a sword in front of them. Now weapons, they have a short sword, then they have a nine foot long spear. And here you can see these spears sticking out. That is usually the first three or four lines of people have spears sticking straight out that's so that you can stab people in front of you. The next couple lines have their spears at an angle so that they can be ready to strike if needed. And then behind that, everybody has their spears up in the air ready for action. You pretty much have a moving wall of people coming towards you that is impenetrable. That's the pro. The con though, it's very slow, it can't go backwards, it cannot turn, it cannot go uphill, it cannot go downhill, it can only fight moving forward on flat ground. Doesn't sound effective, but everybody used this style of fighting. Nobody thought, hey, let's attack them from the side for hundreds of years. So you have these two big moving walls of men hitting each other, doing battle. Another very important thing you have are leagues. Different 
groups of people kind of they make allies and make friends and you have these federations these leagues and they kind of join together and these leagues start to work together fight together whatever it might be all right the lyric age all right so the lyric age is going to start around 800 bc and it's going to go until about 500 bc and it's when the dark ages really end now the Greek population is going to increase and the Greeks are going to start colonizing places around them uh, to try and expand a little bit. This is going to expand Greek culture all through the Mediterranean Sea to places like Turkey, France, Italy, and Spain. And then Eastern culture and Egyptian culture is going to come in as well. Now let's talk just a, for a minute about Sparta, and you can see here that's where Sparta is. It's on the Peloponnesian Peninsula. Sparta's all about war. Uh, they begin their first war in 735 BC against their neighbors, the Mycenaeans. It takes them 20 years to conquer Mycenae. The land is taken from the Mycenaeans. The people are taken as slaves, and these slaves are known as helots. Now the helots, they revolt a couple of years later in 650 BC and then it's going to take Sparta 30 years to end that rebellion. Now, afterwards people are kind of tired of fighting. There's a guy named Lycurgus who creates some change and he's going to say okay all citizens are equal. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few and people are going to start eating together, watching each other and taking care of each other. It's very much um, all must serve the state if you will. There's no family life, the government raises the children, everybody can parent the kids. Boys are raised in herds, uh, to, they're trained from about seven years of age in how to be warriors. There's also this idea of exposure where the, the government can decide whether your kid will live or die. Now Spartan womanhood is particularly interesting. Young girls, they also do military style training, not because they're gonna fight, but because they need to grow up to be healthy women to have healthy children. Marriage is going to occur around 19 to 20, not because they believe in women's rights, but because they know that women who are between age 18 and 20 are sexually and physically mature and can have healthier children. Marriage is by capture, and yes, that does say rape. What happens is the girl who is going to be the wife is carried off in the middle of the night her hair is cut she's dressed like a boy and then she is shoved into this dark room uh, the husband the bee visits has his way with the woman and if the woman gets pregnant then the marriage is considered complete it's pretty gruesome uh, the family is expected to raise three boys to adulthood all while the man is not living with the wife uh, he's living somewhere else usually in a military barracks or something now if you're going to raise three boys to adulthood in that day it meant on average if you are a woman you're going to have 12 kids six boys six girls and you figure three of each are going to raise be raised to adulthood the husband controlled all matters. The women were basically perpetual children. The men controlled property. The women were seen of as property. And the women, they didn't have much say. Now, Spartan culture lacked a lot. The food was simple. The stories were simple. The paintings were simple. The music was simple. And it all had to do with warfare. Excuse me. Now Athens, a little bit different story, and here you can see where Athens is located compared to Sparta. There it is. Athens is going to take some baby steps and try to become a democracy. Now it all starts when this guy named Cylon around 630 BC attempts to take control of Athens, throws out the rule book, and become a bad tyrant. He's defeated, and the wealthy aristocrats of Athens are so afraid of another tyrant taking over, they go and they find this guy named Draco and ask him, write us a code of laws, create us a constitution, and he does. And it's very, very 
harsh in fact it's thought of that there's only one punishment for anything death well Draco's laws are in place for a couple dozen years uh, there's a lot of unrest because Draco's laws are so daunting and there's this part of Draco's laws that deals with debt if you are in debt and you can't pay off your debt then whoever you owe the debt to becomes your owner yes you become a slave because of debt so what would happen is farmers would struggle to survive uh, if they went into debt they would try and put their land up as collateral they say i will pay you back this year and if not you can take my land well if that doesn't work then the farmer would have another chance hey if this doesn't work this year then you can take my land and you can take my family well if it doesn't work that second year you got two choices you can either turn your family over and your family can become slaves or you can run away and a lot of farmers started to run away from Athens well there's this guy named Solon or Solon who's asked to solve this issue of debt and that solve this issue of slavery and he's gonna come in charge of everything around 600 595 BC first thing he does is free all the slaves then he cancels all the debts and then he says you can never become a slave because you owe money after that's done he is going to send a letter out to all the people from Athens who ran away and said come back home it's safe everything works fine for a couple of years eventually there's another tyrant who takes over uh, his name is not important but fast forward to about 500 BC and a man named Cleisthenes takes over the government and he rewrites the constitution of Athens and makes it a democracy uh, the power is going to be given to an elected assembly of 500 members and citizenship is going to go to all the males who live in Athens and 140 villages that surround Athens so votership and the right to vote is expanded very very much now most of the power is still going to be in the hands the highest officials are still going to be aristocrats but the citizens for the first time actually have a say in what's going on the last thing and i'm going to put this under democracy because it is kind of important is the idea of ostracism uh, every year there was a vote taken by the people to see if somebody needed to be kicked out of the city if there was a vote yes somebody needs to be kicked out then there was a second vote do we actually kick jeff out or not if jeff and that's a proper greek name right if jeff was voted to be ostracized he would be exiled from athens for 10 years now, he kept all of his citizenship rights he kept all of his property he just couldn't live in athens for 10 years think of it like a 10 year long time out after 10 years was over he could come home and he could come back and take everything back now there are two wars to talk about and then I'll be done with this long video here uh, there's the Persian War the Persian War is going to happen in 490 there's a guy named Darius who's the Emperor of the Persians he's going to attack Athens and Athens is going to defeat Darius and the Persian Empire at the Battle of Marathon. That's where a Greek soldier runs 26 and a half miles. He warns the people of Athens that an attack is coming, and then according to tradition, he falls over dead. Athens is able to get an army out. They defeat the Persians at the Battle of Marathon. The Persians leave, but they come back 10 years later. The son of Darius, a guy named Xerxes, comes back with an army of 150,000 men. The Persians are able to defeat the Spartans at the Battle of Thermopylae. That's where the Battle of the 300 happens, if you are a, uh, a movie fan. And, but the Athenians are able to defeat Persia in the water at the Battle of Salamis. So the Persian War ends with the 
Greeks eventually joining together and beating the Persians. Now fast forward to just a little bit longer, there's been kind of this cold war brewing between Athens and Sparta. Uh, Athens has its own league, Sparta has its own league, and they both want to be the most important and the most powerful of the Greek city-states. Well, in 431 BC, this cold war turns hot. Um, Athens declares war on Sparta, Sparta declares war on Athens, and before you know it, there's fighting all over the place in Greece. Sparta is going to invade the area around Athens five times in the next seven years, but they never defeat Athens. Uh, there's a stalemate. They decide, okay, this isn't doing much good. There's 10 years of, pay, of peace, but in 421 BC, the war starts again. It lasts another seven or eight years. And finally, Athens is defeated by Sparta in 413 BC. A lot of stuff happens here. Now, once again, this is just the first half of the Greece lecture. We'll talk about what else happens. Uh, we'll talk about Alexander the Great and everything on Wednesday. Now, one last thing to warn you about. This is the week that the second reflection paper is due, and you can use anything from last week, anything from India, anything from China, or anything from the Greek readings for your second reflection paper. Also, next week is the midterm. Believe it or not, we're already at the halfway point of this semester. All right, we'll be back with you on Wednesday, hopefully sooner than 9.45 at night. Talk to you soon.